Okay, students, assalamu alaikum. Today we are going to uh, start with our next lecture and which is about the topic of uh, fluid properties. So for the next uh, two weeks, this week and the next week, uh, we'll have, uh, we'll continue with the topic of fluid properties. Uh, since we are studying fluid mechanics, so it's important to understand uh, about fluid properties first and then move towards the regular study of the fluid statics. Okay, the conceptual knowledge you're going to get in this uh, in, in this chapter will be about certain fluid properties such as density, specific gravity, viscosity, surface tension, vapor pressure, bulk model of, of elasticity. You'll be able to identify, differentiate between absolute viscosity and kinematic viscosity. Uh, you'll be able to describe how shear stress, viscosity, and the velocity distribution are related and things related to this viscosity and density, vapor pressure, variation with temperature and pressure. Uh, outlining, uh, uh, we'll have, uh, we'll first discuss a little about system and the associated concepts, system properties. Then we're going to characterize mass and weight, rate of shear strain, shear force and shear stress, viscosity, we're going to talk about Newtonian and non-Newtonian fluids, elasticity, surface tension, and vapor pressure. These are all the properties of the fluids that we are going to study in this chapter. Okay, briefly going through systems and the associated concepts. Uh, something which is pretty clear from the course of thermodynamics as well, which you have studied there. Uh, whatever your focus of interest in the numericals related to fluid mechanics or in the topic related to fluid mechanics, whatever is your focus of interest is considered as system. So the system might change based upon your focus of interest. Sometimes you're interested in studying something and that becomes your system. Then you start studying something else and that does not, or, or that uh, uh, goes out of the system, okay? So system is anything which is under study, under observation, okay? Then out, outside the system, everything else is considered as surrounding, okay? So outside the system, everything else is considered as surrounding. And the thing which is actually differentiating the system and the surrounding is the boundary. So boundary is something which differentiates the system and the surrounding. So on one side of the boundary, you'll have the system. On the other side of the boundary, you will have the surrounding. Okay? So this is uh, nothing new. This is exactly the same which we studied in the course of thermodynamics. Okay, so the next thing is about a process. So process is basically, it is a change of a system from one state to another. So whenever a change is occurring, okay? So change is uh, linked with, associated with the property, uh, which is uh, by a process. So state is anything, any specific condition of a system. Okay, so system properties. Uh, property is a measurable characteristic of a system that depends only on the present state. So whatever is the present state of a system, that is known as property. Okay. Properties related to the total mass of the system are called extensive properties. Okay, and the one which are independent of the mass, they are known as intensive properties. Okay, you should know the difference between extensive and intensive properties. One depends on one depends on mass, one does not depend on mass, okay? So uh, the way to memorize this is that uh, independent, intensive, both starting with in, okay? So which is independent of mass are intensive. The other one depends on mass, so that will be extensive. Okay? This is just a mind, te mind technique to memorize it, okay? But anyways, it is important that you should know that what are the intensive properties, what are the extensive properties. You're going to cover this, this concept uh, in a topic of uh, uh, Renault transport theorem, which we are going to study not today, 
but probably in the next few lectures. So properties are expressed in terms of a number of basic primary dimensions, like for example, length, mass, or force, time, temperature, which are quantified by basic and primary units. There are two types of system of units, the SI unit and the traditional units. Traditional units are basically the English system. Okay, so foot, pound, mass. Okay, this is basically the traditional or English system. SI units are comparatively easier to use. Most of the time we'll be using the SI system, but you are you need to be aware of the English system as well. Okay. Okay, when we talk about the SI system of units, the basic units of mass, length, time, temperature are kilogram, meter, second, Kelvin. Okay, the unit of force is Newton and Newton can be written as kg meter per second square, you know, by the second law of motion, F is equals to ma. Okay, so force is, the unit of force will be Newton. And so you can define Newton as ma, which is mass into acceleration. Mass will be kg, acceleration will be meter per second square. Okay, unit of work and energy is joule, which is basically Newton meter. These are in the English, oh, sorry, these are in the SI system of units. For the traditional units, uh, we'll have the units of uh, slug, which is for the case of uh, mass, then we can have the unit of foot, second, and degree Fahrenheit. Okay. And uh, so another mass unit is basically pound mass. Okay. So there is also a conversion, uh, conversion uh, between slug and pound mass. Okay. So unit of force is pound force. Pound mass and pound force are different things. Okay. And generally, sometimes the both are written as pound, but you have to understand by the by the nature of the problem that whether it is a pound force mentioned here or it's a pound mass. The unit of work is foot pound. Okay, so here foot pound is mostly pound force here, which is used as a unit of work. But anyways, you need to be aware of the English units as well as with the SI unit, but most of the time we'll be using the SI units. So far, everything is clear. Anybody have anything to ask? Okay, characterizing mass and weight. Mass and weight of a fluid is characterized with three properties, which are density, specific weight, specific gravity. Look, you need to understand the definition of these terms, but at the same time, you need to understand physically what does they mean. When we talk about density, so physically, what does density mean? how heavy is something you know the formula of density it's mass per unit volume mass per unit volume is a formula of density but physically you need to understand what does it mean so something how heavy it is so you have a, an object which has a density of 44 another object has a density of 45 kg per meter cube which one will be heavier 45 45 is greater than 44 so that means the one which has a higher value of density must be heavier okay so you need to understand that. So whenever we say mass density, we are actually referring to the heaviness of an object, heaviness of a substance. How heavy is some, some, something compared to the other, okay? So yeah, and numerically we know it is mass per unit volume at a point. Mathematically, its density is written as rho, okay? Sometimes it becomes very confusing because rho is sometimes, it looks like it is written p, small p, but it's not p it is rho, okay? So where you'll have pressure, mostly it comes in the uh, ideal gas equation of, uh, ideal gas law of equation, okay? So P equals to rho RT. So there, there is P and rho both, okay? So you have to understand which one is pressure and which one is density. Symbolically, they're quite similar in writing. This mass per unit volume, density of some fluids is more easily changed than that of the others. Compare density variation of air and water in table A3A5. Okay, table A3A5 you find in your textbook. Okay, and textbook is already uploaded on GCR. Soft copy of the complete textbook is uploaded, uploaded on GCR. So you can just simply download it and you can go through with the textbook uh, while you're going through with this course. So in the textbook, you'll have table A3 for variation of uh, density of air, uh, table A5 for the variation of density of water. And you can see that uh, air 
density varies significantly compared to that of water. Okay, so water is considered to be incompressible because the density change is very small over a large pressure range. So you can apply a lot of pressure, but the change in the density or heaviness of water is very, very small. So water is considered almost incompressible, okay? Because it does not compress, its volume does not change. Since the volume is not changing that much, so the density is not changing that much. And so it's considered almost incompressible. On the other hand, air, if you change the pressure, its volume is going to change significantly. And so, yes, the density will also change. And so it's not incompressible. Useful to memorize, density of water is 1000 kg per meter cube. Now, this is something that you should memorize. What is the density of water? Is 1000 kg per meter cube. Yeah, in case if there is a variation in the density of water, it will be uh, it will be mentioned in the question that yes, the density of water is variable. Or if if, if the value is other than thousand, then it will be provided in the problem that okay, the value the density of water is like nine thousand nine nine eight or nine nine seven, whatever it is. Okay. So if nothing is provided, then you will you will just by default take the density of water as one thousand kg per meter cube. And this is something that you should memorize. Okay. Uh, so this 1000 kg per meter cube means it is uh, one kg per liter or one gram per milliliter. It's a simple conversion. Okay, so density, is, is density clear? Okay, next thing is the specific weight. Now there's a formula of a specific weight but let's first try to understand what is a specific weight means. Suppose, suppose I have a room of one meter by one meter by one meter. So this is also one meter, this is also one meter, this is also one meter. Okay. So if I fill this room with some substance, so what will be the weight of the room? So suppose if I fill this whole room with water, so what will be the weight of water? What will be the weight of this room? Okay, That will be the specific weight of water. If I fill it, fill it with oil, that will be the, the weight of this will be the specific weight of oil. So it's basically a room of one meter by one meter by one meter. So one meter cube. Okay. So if you fill it, if you fill it, let's say with the iron, that solid block of iron, now what will be the weight? That will be the specific weight. If you fill it with mercury, that will be the specific weight of mercury. So specific weight means um, weight per unit volume and unit volume is one meter cube. So you have a box, you have, you have a room of one meter cube, one meter by one meter by one meter, fill it with anything and see the weight. Okay. So that will be the specific weight. So specific weight is mentioned as gamma. Okay. This is how we write specific weight is gamma. So gamma is weight over volume and uh, weight, you know, weight is mg, right? So mg over volume, but mass over volume is density. So we can write here it's as rho g. So gamma is also written as rho g, right? Unit will be what? Weight, what's the unit of weight? Newton. Unit of weight is Newton. And what's the unit of volume? Meter cube. So the unit of the specific weight is Newton per meter cube. Okay. When we're talking about water, so I told you to memorize the density of water. How much is the density of water? Thousand. So thousand is the density of water. What is the value of G? 9.81. It's fixed. Acceleration due to gravity. So what will be the value of gamma of water? So it will be 9810, 1000 multiplied by 9.81. So it will be 9810 Newton per meter cube. Okay, so other values of gamma are presented in the table. Okay, on the table F4 to F6, front of textbook, or table A2 to A5. Okay, so these values are provided in the textbook for different materials. But for the case of water, it is something that we should memorize. For water, the value of gamma is 9810. Value of the value of density is 1000. G is the acceleration due to gravity. It's 9.81, okay? Units are very important. Don't mess up in units. This is the unit, okay? 
Okay, don't mess up in Unix. Okay, specific weight concept is clear or not? Okay. Okay. So next thing is, is specific gravity. Now again, before moving towards the formula, first let's get the concept, physical concept. Specific gravity is when you compare an object with water, is the object heavier than water or is the object lighter than water? In, in essence, it's like saying, if I throw this thing in water, will it sink? or will it float? If it is lighter, it will float. If it is heavier, it will sink. But heavier than what? Heavier than water, then it will sink. Lighter than what? Lighter than water, okay? So uh, the concept of a specific gravity comes from this question that if I throw this thing in water, will it float or will it sink? So we are comparing the weight of anything with the weight of water. Is it clear? So we are comparing the weight of anything with the weight of water. So specific gravity, first of all, specific gravity is a ratio. So it is a ratio here. This point is very important. So ratio means density of any material, solid, liquid, whatever it is, density of anything with the density of water. Ratio of density of anything with the density of, to the density of water, okay? So, or, or the specific weight of any material with the specific weight of water. Okay. So first of all, it is a ratio. So what will be the unit of a specific gravity? No, it's a ratio, means it will be unitless. Density over density cancels each other. Specific weight over specific weight cancels each other. So if it is a specific gravity and you put a unit in exam for it, so you will lose marks. Okay. If it is a specific weight and you forget to write the unit of a specific weight, you will lose marks because it, it has unit, but a specific gravity is unitless because it is a ratio. So if it is a ratio of anything with the ratio of uh, density of water, so first of all, it is unitless. Secondly, now we have to look at it that what will be the value of this ratio. If the value of the ratio is equals to one, equals to one, what does this mean? It means that the density of this object is equal to the density of water, okay? Well, we never know whether it will float or sink because if its density is equal to that of water, it might float, it might sink, okay? It might go with the flow, okay? However, if the density, if, if the specific gravity is less than one, less than one means denominator, denominator is a higher value than numerator, means it will float. Less than one means it is lighter than water. Denominator is the density of water, numerator is the density of the of that object. So specific gravity less than one means denominator is bigger than the numerator. So density of water is higher. So that means it will float. It's not going to sink. On the other hand, if the density of that object is higher than that of water, then the specific gravity value will be greater than one. And that means this object is going to sink. So this is the physical understanding for the specific gravity of an object, okay? Now, regarding the theoretical question that can come in the exam, I, I can ask you, what is the difference between a specific gravity and a specific weight? So a specific weight is the weight of any object uh, for the unit volume. Specific gravity is a ratio. When you compare an object's density with the density of water. Okay. Another question that can come is, uh, uh, how can we tell if an object is heavier than water or lighter than water using the specific gravity? 
So check the value of a specific gravity. If the specific gravity is greater than one, that means the object is heavier than water. So it will sink. Check the value of a specific gravity. If the specific gravity is less than one, that means that the object is lighter than water and so it will float. Okay. So these are some of the theoretical conceptual questions that can come in the exam. Okay, so this, see this very, uh, this example, numerical problem, simple one. So we have uh, the, uh, the specific weight of mercury is given as 133 kilo Newton per meter cube. Calculate the density and the specific gravity of the mercury. Okay, so first of all, this uh, specific weight gamma is equals to rho G. G is known, gamma is given in the question. So you can find what is rho. Rho is the density, okay? Now, once you know the density, now it's asked to find out the specific gravity of the mercury. Specific gravity of the mercury will be density of mercury. Mercury is Hg, right? Divided by density of water, which is H2O. Density of water is something which I told you is known. Specific gravity, you have to find out. Density of mercury is something you have already determined. So just use this and you can find it. Here they are using the ratio of uh, specific weights, but this is okay as well. Both are going to give you the same answer, okay? So the specific gravity of mercury is 13.6. What does this mean? Mercury is heavier than water. And how much heavier? 13.6 times heavier than water. So, okay, that's it. So, is, the, is the concept of specific gravity clear? Okay. There's a simple problem related to um, ideal gas law. Ideal gas law problem. Air at standard air at standard air at standard sea level pressure P equals to one zero one kilonewton per meter cube. Now the standard sea level pressure is something that you all should also memorize. What is the atmospheric pressure? Atmospheric pressure is one zero one three two five pascal, or one zero one point three two five kilopascal. One pascal is one newton per meter square. Okay, so here it is one zero one kilonewton per meter square, has a temperature of four degrees centigrade. What is the density of the air? Okay, so it's the ideal gas equation of the state. So we have P equals to rho R T. Temperature is given, right? Four degrees centigrade. Then pressure, it's sea, pressure, uh, sea level pressure, atmospheric pressure, this is also given. R is the gas constant. So it's, it's kind of a fixed value, okay? R for the case of uh, air is 287 joule per kg Kelvin. Obviously the value of R will be provided to you in the exam, okay? Either in the form of the problem itself, within the problem it will be provided, or let's say a separate table is provided where the value of R is given, okay? So, but it will be provided to you. Don't need to memorize it, but always check the unit. Always check the unit. This is an important thing because sometimes the value is given in joules, other time values are given in kilojoules. So here, the pressure, if you are using in kilonewton, then you can use, you should use the value of kilojoule. Otherwise, it's better to use the value of newtons, okay? So kilo is there in newtons or kilo is there in joules. You have to make sure that there's compatibility with it, okay? So you see here, since the R value was in joules, so you wanted to use the pressure in newton as well, instead of using kilonewton. That's why you see 101 into 10 to power three. Why there is 10 to the power three? Because R was not given in kilojoule, R was given in joules. Okay, so you need to be consistent within your units. So substitute the values here of P, R and T. T obviously temperature should be in the absolute temperature scale, not in degree centigrade. So absolute temperature scale would be Kelvin. So you have to add 273 into the degree centigrade. So you're gonna get the value of uh, density, which is 1.27 kg per meter cube. It's a simple problem. There's nothing complicated into it. 
So everything is clear so far? Is there anything which is not clear? Anything anybody want to ask? Okay, so now let's uh, talk about uh, a little concept of viscosity. Now we are going to build our uh, uh, build our concept so that we learn the, the real concept of fluid viscosity. Okay. First of all, before talking about the engineering concepts of viscosity, again, it's important to understand things physically. So what does viscosity mean? Viscosity means how thick is something. Okay. So whenever we say that this fluid is very thick, thick fluid means what? If you, if, if you drop it, or if, you, if, 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 if that fluid falls on something, it's going to flow, but flow not very easily. The flow would be slow, okay? Because it is thick, like for example, honey, ketchup, very thick fluids, okay? So they take a lot of time to move. Comparatively water uh, or any oil, oils are, sometimes oils are very thick, sometimes oils are very thin, okay? Uh, alcohol, okay, or any other thing, okay? So. So these are thin fluids, okay? So uh, in Urdu, we say gara. A fluid jo bahut zada easily move kar raha hai, wo patla fluid hota hai. A fluid jo bahut mushkil se move kar raha hai, wo gara. So that's basically is viscosity, okay? So uh, there are two fluids. One fluid has viscosity 120. Other fluid has viscosity 130. So do you think which fluid will be more thick? 130, because when you have the numerical values, you can judge based on the numerical values, which value is higher, which is smaller. So the fluid which has larger value of viscosity means it is thick, it will be difficult for it to flow. At the same time, uh, more power is exerted by this fluid when it flows. More power is exerted by this fluid when it flows. Comparatively less power is exerted by the fluid, uh, which is less thick for to flow. Okay, so this is uh, both way around. Okay. So this is the concept of viscosity. Okay, so now the, the concept of viscosity involves moving fluid. Involves moving fluid. So if the fluid is stationary, then there is no concept of viscosity. The concept of viscosity only comes when the fluid starts to move. So is it moving quickly or is it moving slowly? Here comes the question of viscosity. Okay. So the motion of fluid is linked with the shear strain. Because suppose you have, suppose you have a fluid element here and the fluid element is in motion. So when the fluid element is in motion, so the layers of fluid are in motion. Okay. And uh, obviously the motion of the fluid element is related with the force element, which is in the direction of the motion. And that force element would be considered as a shear force. And correspondingly, the fluid elements, if you consider the fluid element as like this, so because of the shear force, the fluid element is going to deform. And that will be the deformation of the fluid elements, okay? And this deformation would be, uh, would be shear deformation or shear strain. I think you have taken the course of strength of material, right? So you do understand the concept of stress and strain. And then you have the concept of normal stress, normal strain and shear stress, shear strain. So what is shear strain? Shear strain is the angular deformation. If you, if you, if you recall, if you memorize, okay, linear strain is the linear deformation, but shear strain is the angular deformation. Something is changing its shape such that the angles are being changed. That body is deformed, okay? So that's the angular deformation. So here the angular deformation would be represented in terms of phi, del phi. So rate of change of this angular deformation is important here, which will be rate of change of shear strain, which is del phi by del t, because it's continuous deformation. The fluid is continuously moving, continuous deformation is not being stopped. In case of the solids, you, you apply the force, there is a little deformation, then you stop the force, it stops. Here, there is a continuous deformation. Deformation is not stopping. So the fluid is flowing, okay? So we are talking about rate of shear strain. 
Okay, so rate of shear strain will be del phi by del T. Now, if you analyze this small right angle triangle here, this is small right angle triangle. Okay, so this is a right angle triangle with the uh, with the base as del Y, which is the length of the fluid element. Okay, and uh, the perpendicular will, will be this deformation. Okay, and this deformation is suppose if that if the velocity here is del V and the time it takes to move is del T. So S is equals to VT. In dynamics, you have a steady, okay? V equals to S by T or S is equals to VT. So this distance will be del V into del T. And the angle here will be del phi, okay? So if, if I just analyze this right angle triangle, I will say that tangent of del phi will be this distance, del V into del T. You can say this is del S, okay? Divided by del Y by considering this small right angle triangle, okay? Now, when we have a limiting case, we are talking when the del phi is very, very small. For the limiting case, tangent of del phi will be approximately equal to del phi. Now, this is a mathematical concept, okay? So you, the tan of any angle will be equal to that angle if that angle is very, very small, okay? So, we can just substitute here del phi as uh, tan of del phi as just del phi. So the formula becomes del phi equals to del V del T by del Y or del phi by del T. If I, if I take this del T on the other side of the equation, so del phi by del T is the rate of shear strain. So we get the formula for rate of shear strain. So rate of shear strain is basically del V by del Y, which is the velocity gradient. So within this fluid element, how the velocity is changing across the thickness of the fluid, okay? So that is the rate of shear strain. Now, why did we develop this thing? Because we need to develop the formula for uh, the viscosity. Now let's talk about shear force and shear stress, okay? Now, shear stress is basically what? It is the tendential force divided by the, surf, divided by the surface area. So if I have the fluid element and I apply tendential force across the certain uh, area of the fluid, so there will be shear stress applied over the fluid. And because of the shear stress, there will be shear strain. That means there will be flow, okay? So this is what it is. Shear stress will be tendential force over surface area or tendential force is the force which is making the fluid to move. Okay, surface area will be the area of the fluid. Okay. So that will be shear stress. Now here comes the concept of viscosity. The idea is that the more force you are going to apply, the quicker the fluid will move. This is a general concept. If I apply more force, the quicker the fluid will move. If I apply less force, the fluid will move slowly. So the motion of the fluid, mo the, the, the motion of the fluid body depends upon the application of force. Larger the force, larger will be the motion. Okay. Smaller the force, smaller will be the motion. Okay. So instead instead of writing it in terms of the force, we'll say in terms of the in terms of the stress. What's the relationship between force and stress? Stress is similar to pressure, force per unit area. Okay, so that's basically pressure, which is also stress, same, same units, okay? So instead of saying force, now I'm going to say stress. So larger the stress I apply, more will be the flow. Smaller the stress I apply, smaller will be the flow. This means what? This means that my sh shear stress is directly proportional to the flow, right? Larger the flow, large, larger the stress, larger will be the flow. Smaller the stress, smaller will be the flow, okay? And the flow is dependent upon this rate of change of strain. Flow is dependent upon, flow is dependent upon rate of change of strain, means del phi by del t, okay? Because for the case of fluid, 
rate of change of a strain is something that defines the flow. Okay, so how quickly the fluid is is deforming means the fluid is flowing. Okay, and this means rate of change of a strain with time is basically linked with velocity gradient. This is what we developed earlier, right? We said rate of change of a strain is this. This is what we said earlier. Rate of change of a strain is velocity gradient. Right? So you see here, shear stress is directly proportional to flow, means directly proportional to del phi by del t, means directly proportional to dv by dy. Okay, so that means I can say here that tau is directly proportional to dv by dy. Now in physics, when you have to remove the constant of proportionality by when you replace it by equal sign. So we, there comes a constant of proportionality, right? This constant of proportionality here is viscosity. This constant of proportionality here is viscosity, okay? So if I remove it, so it will become tau is equals to, I will say here C dV by dy, constant of proportionality. But here this C is basically mu, which is the viscosity. So it is basically a fluid property. So you can have two different fluids where you apply the same stress, but both the fluids will have the shear the flow will have different flow. Why? Because they are different fluids. They are different properties. With the same application of the shear stress, one fluid will might flow faster, other might flow a little slower. For what is the reason? Because the fluid is different. And that's a fluid property, which is viscosity, okay? which is the resistance between the layers of the fluid. If there was no resistance, the fluid will move very fast. But it is between the layers of the fluid, there is resistance, and that makes the, that makes the flow of fluid becomes difficult because they are resisting the motion of fluid. So larger this resistance, difficult will be the fluid to flow. Smaller the resistance, easily the fluid will flow. Is it clear? Okay. So here comes the mathematically concept of viscosity. So viscosity, you can write here, viscosity is basically what? It is the ratio of shear stress to rate of velocity gradient of the fluid, right? Okay, what's the unit of shear stress? What's the unit of shear stress? As I told you, st stress is similar to pressure. So what's the unit of pressure? Newton per, per meter square. Okay, so unit here will be Newton per meter square. What will be the unit of dv by dy? dv is velocity gradient, velocity per unit distance. So velocity, unit of velocity is meter per second. Okay, so dv by dy will have meter per second divided by distance, which is meter. So meter, meter will cancel. So it will just per second, okay? So you see here, Newton per meter square divided by per second. So second is going to go up, okay? So the unit of viscosity becomes what? Unit of viscosity becomes, see here, Newton second per meter square. Make sense? That will be the unit of viscosity. Now we call it as dynamic or absolute viscosity. We call it as dynamic or absolute viscosity. There are two names. Sometimes it's, just, in fact, three names. Whenever it is written viscosity without anything, that means it is dynamic viscosity. That means it is absolute viscosity. But there's another viscosity which is known as kinematic viscosity. If it is kinematic viscosity, it will be written as kinematic viscosity. The word kinematic will be there. But if it is just written viscosity, then you have to presume that, okay, it is dynamic viscosity or absolute viscosity. Is this concept clear so far? We're, we're talking some 
very basic physical understanding level uh, concepts okay, of the fluid properties. We should understand the fluid itself first before going towards uh, studying the fluid statics or the fluid dynamics. Okay, so none of the derivation here is important. I have ex explained it to you just for your understanding, but it's not going to come in the exam. Unit of viscosity is something you should memorize. Unit of viscosity is something you should memorize. So consequently, you have to memorize this formula, tau equals to mu dv by dy. It's a very simple formula, but you're going to use it a lot in different problems. So probably when you're going to solve a lot of numericals related to it, automatically it's going to be memorized in your head. But in, in, in case you are not able to memorize it, still I will ask you to memorize it, okay? And with, this mem uh, with, with the memorizing of this formula, that unit of viscosity is very clear then, right? Your unit of stress is clear dv by dy unit is clear. So you can drive yourself if you forget what is the unit of viscosity. So it's basically Newton second per meter square. That will be the unit of viscosity. Okay, from there we come up with the two observations. Okay, these two are very important observations. The first observation is that the velocity gradient becomes smaller with the distance from the boundary. Okay. Therefore, the maximum shear stress is at the boundary. So at the boundary, if you see here, okay, uh, velocity gradient depends upon the slope. Okay. This is, this means there is no slope. This means there is a little, there, there is a little slope. This means the slope is higher. This means this is the maximum slope. Okay, so if you see here, this velocity profile, if you see the velocity profile, maximum slope is at the, at the, at the boundary. Then as you keep moving away from the boundary, it is becoming more and more uh, vertical. So the slope is decreasing until a time reach when the slope finishes. So when the slope finishes, that means uh, there is no velocity gradient at all. Okay. So one, one thing is very clear that the velocity gradient becomes a smaller with distance from the boundary. If you are closer to the boundary, the velocity gradient will be higher. And if the velocity gradient is higher, means shear stress is higher. Okay. So uh, understand one thing, suppose if the fluid is moving, suppose if, suppose if the fluid is moving and you put a piece of paper on the fluid, what will happen? The piece of paper will move with the fluid. The fluid is taking the piece of paper with it. Right, so fluid is exerting the force. Okay, so this force exertion is most stronger at the edges at the boundary. And as you move away from the boundary, okay, the force exertion will be smaller. Okay, so uh, suppose uh, you have uh, you have a plate and there is a there is a fluid flowing across the plate and suppose you can put your finger in it. So you, your finger will feel more resistance when it is near to the plate, less resistance when it is far away from the plate. Okay. Second thing is the no slip condition. Now the no slip condition says what? The layers of fluid which is in contact with the surface, okay, it, it stays at the same velocity as that of the surface. Okay, so it does not slip, it is thick with the surface, okay? So if I have a stationary plate, so the fluid moving across it, so the layer of the fluid which is in contact with that stationary surface, that layer will be stationary. Above the layers, there will be velocity, 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 but the layer which is in contact with that stationary surface will be stationary. So that's a no slip condition. Okay? okay, the kinematic viscosity is basically what? Dynamic viscosity mu, if you divide this by density, so you're going to get kinematic viscosity. Now, what will be the unit of kinematic viscosity? I want you to drive the unit of kinematic viscosity now. Tell me what is the unit of kinematic viscosity? Dynamic viscosity unit we just discussed. Okay. 
So put the value of dynamic units of dynamic viscosity, put the unit of density and tell me what is the unit of kinematic viscosity. So this is the unit of, this is the unit of dynamic viscosity. Newton second per meters. And what is the unit of uh, AG per meter per? Convert Newton into kg meter per second square. Convert Newton into kg meter per second square when you are driving the unit for uh, kinematic viscosity. Tell me the unit of dynamic, uh, tell me the unit of kinematic viscosity. Let me tell you, it should come meter square per second. Now try to drive it. It's simple, just put the units. Anybody have been able to do it yet? Newton is what? Newton is kg meter per second square. So let me do it myself here. Okay. So kinematic viscosity is dynamic viscosity over density. Dynamic viscosity is Newton second per meter square, right? And density is uh, kg per meter cube. Okay. Now Newton is kg meter per second square into second. Uh, here will be the here will be the meter square divided by kg per meter cube, right? Okay. So kg will cancel with this kg. 
let's say this s will be cancelled by this s okay so s is square okay so it's one square will be cancelled okay this m will be cancelled by this and here will be oh, okay here it becomes a square and this m will be cancelled so it becomes what m square is here so it will going to go it's going to go up so m square upon second is it clear so it is meter square upon second you should be able to drive the units yourself in case you are forgetting it you should be able to drive the units yourself okay is this derivation clear meter square per second that's the kinematic viscosity the formula for kinematic viscosity dynamic viscosity units for these will not be provided in exam you are supposed to memorize them okay so the general concept of viscosity is clear to everybody right is there anything which is not clear within the general concept of viscosity what does viscosity means is this thing clear okay. now let's discuss about the variation of viscosity with temperature variation of viscosity with temperature okay so let's first talk about a gas now what happened is that suppose if I have a container and this container is filled with gas, now if I if 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 I heat it, so the gas try to expand, but cannot expand because there is container, so it is compressed inside. Want to expand but cannot expand. So the thing is that the gas becomes a bitter a bit thicker. Why? Because it want to expand but cannot expand. So it's like you are compressing the gas. So when the gas is compressed, the molecules come close to each other. Molecules coming close to each other means it will become thick. The gas will become comparatively thick. Okay. So the viscosity of a gas, if you increase the temperature, the viscosity will increase for the case of gas. Is it clear? So the viscosity of the gas increases with temperature. This is a very important concept. Could be asked in the exam because for the case of liquid, it is a posit. We're going to discuss the liquid later. Okay. The viscosity of a gas increases with the temperature of the gas. The variation of gas viscosity with absolute temperature can be can be estimated by Sutherland's equation. This is the Sutherland's equation. This equation is used to determine the viscosity of the gas with varying temperature. Now, whenever this equation is required in the exam, you do not have to memorize it. This equation will be provided in the exam. Is it clear? This is the Sutherland's equation. So here mu naught is the viscosity at temperature T naught. So if we want to know what is the variation of viscosity with temperature, at least you need to know the viscosity of that gas at a certain temperature. Then you can find the viscosity of that gas at any other temperature. But you need to know the viscosity of that gas at one specific temperature. And then you have the Sutherland's constant for that gas. So Sutherland constant S. It's different for different gases. For the case of air, the Sutherland constant is triple one Kelvin. But again, these constants will be provided to you in the exam if required. Okay. So this is the formula mu over mu naught equals to T upon T naught power three by two into T naught plus S divided by T plus S. Okay. So uh, mu naught and T naught should be given. And then you need to find mu at a specific T. So one is unknown, mu is unknown, and you can find out what is it. 
Okay. S will be given to you for that specific gas. And S is a material property. So if you change the gas, the value of S will change. Okay, so it is table A2 in the book. Either the table will be provided to you in the exam or the value of S will be provided to you directly in the numerical. Okay. So there is a simple problem. Dynamic viscosity of air is 15 degree. Uh, at 15 degree is 1.78 into 10 to the power minus five Newton second per meter square. Using Sutherland's equation, find the viscosity at 200 degrees centigrade. Okay, so we are talking about air. Air is a gas. So even if it is not written using Sutherland equation, you should know that you have to use the Sutherland equation. Why? Because air is a gas. Okay, so this is the temperature. This is the temperature known temperature for which you have the viscosity. So this temperature will be So this will be T naught, this will be mu naught, okay? And you have to find out the viscosity at this temperature. So this will be T, right? So it's a simple formula here. You know T, you know mu naught, you know T naught, and this is for air. So you know what is S. Everything else is known, just substitute the values. Remember, do not put the value of temperature in degree centigrade. You have to put the value of temperature in Kelvin. Okay. Substitute the values, you're going to get what is mu. So let's say a student solved the problem and he got the value of mu correctly, but did not write the correct unit or did not write the unit. So minus 0.5 mark will be detected for not writing the unit. So three marks question, 0.5 detected. So you did the question correctly. Still you get 2.5. So make sure that you write the correct unit. You don't need to write the unit anywhere up. Here it is written Newton um, second per meter square in this step. It was not needed here, just in the final answer or wherever you are doing the calculation. At the end of the calculation, you have an answer. If suppose you have a problem where you have in that problem, you have five or six steps. So in each step, you're going to do the calculation and you're gonna get an answer for that step. So whenever you get an answer for any step, you should write a unit with it. But during calculation, you don't need to write the unit. So a problem had six steps and six times to do the calculation and you six times forgot to write the unit. So uh, 0.5 multiplied by six, it becomes three marks, okay? So you lose three marks, even you did the right, the question correctly. Okay. So inshallah, no surprises in the exam, you know it. Okay, next question. Sutherland's equation, we, uh, situation is that we have, uh, we have Sutherland's equation and we need to use it in the, uh, you use it for the ideal gas. So ideal gas laws can be used, okay? So if the air is an ideal gas, so, so if that uh, gas is an ideal gas, you can use the ideal gas equation, okay? We need to determine an expression for kinematic viscosity. Now that expression in Sutherland equation is for dynamic viscosity, mu. But suppose it is for nu, Nu is kinematic viscosity, okay? So if it is nu upon nu naught, so we need to find what would be the expression for it. It's very simple because nu is mu upon rho. So I will write here mu upon rho divided by mu naught upon rho naught, okay? So mu upon mu naught is Sutherland equation. So this mu upon mu naught is the Sutherland equation, which is actually this thing. Okay. Now what's left is rho naught over rho. This rho naught is going to come up. This rho is going to go down. Rho naught over rho. But we know that P is equals to rho RT. Or we can say that rho is equals to P over 
R T. Right. So I can just substitute here P over R T. So it will be P naught over R T naught, and here it will be P over R T. R R will cancel because it's the same gas. So gas constant will be same. So we're going to get P naught over T naught into uh, divided by P naught over T. They divide by P over T. Okay. So it will become P naught into T divided by P into T naught. Okay. So just substitute the values here. You're going to get what is mu b mu upon mu naught mu upon mu naught. Okay. So this t upon t naught is going to be combining with this one. So its its power was three by two. It will become five by two. Okay. And so p p naught upon p into t upon t naught power five by two into t naught plus s divided by t plus s. So this becomes the formula. We derive the formula. Now, what can I do in exam? I can combine this question with the previous question. In the previous question, you were required to find out the viscosity. Now I'll ask you to find out the kinematic viscosity. So first, you are going to derive the formula for kinematic viscosity like it is derived here. Then it is just a matter of putting the values in the formula and get the answer. So you solve this question separately. You solve the previous question separately. In the exam, I will combine the two questions. No new concept. But doctor, we never did it. So, anyways, uh, is this thing clear? So during my lectures, I will always be giving you the correct hint for what I can give you in the exam. The only thing is that you will have a lot of hints that will be a little hard to cover and you will forget some of the hints and then it will be a surprise. Hint. So fortunately, uh, my lectures are being recorded here and you are going to have it. Otherwise, it would have been much fun for me. Still, it will be fun for me because I know that even you have the videos, you're not going to watch it before exam. <laughs> so, anyways. so that was about the viscosity of gas. Is it clear? Anything with regarding the viscosity of gas concept regarding the viscosity of gas, which is not clear, please feel free to ask. Now, viscosity of liquid. The liquid has a different case. Like, for example, if you have a liquid which is thick, if you heat it, that liquid will become thin. It was difficultly flowing. Now you heat it, it will easily flow. So that means the viscosity of the liquid decreases with increasing temperature, opposite to gas. Viscosity of the gas increases with increase in temperature. For liquid, it decreases with increase in temperature. Okay. So it's not going to follow the Sutherland's equation. Sutherland equation was only for the gas. So you'll have a separate equation here. And that separate equation is this one. Mu equals to C E power B minus T. Uh, sorry, B divided by T. Okay. So this equation is again, you are not required to memorize it, but this equation will be provided to you. But let me tell you one thing for those equations, which I'm saying that I will provide in the exam. Do not think that I'm going to give a description of these equations in the exam as well. Sir, here it is written mu equals to C E power B divided by T. Sir, can you tell me what is B? Sir, can you tell me what is this E? Sorry, I cannot tell you. I provided you the equation so that you do not have to memorize it, but given the consideration that you have already gone through the lectures and you understand these terms. So there will be no description, whether given orally or given or written in the exam paper anywhere. Okay. So you have to understand what these formulas are, what are the symbols within these formulas. Yeah, do not, do, you do not need to memorize them because they will be provided but you need to know what does they mean, okay? 
So mu equals to C e power P divided by T. That is the formula for the viscosity of the liquid. Where C and B are constants and T is the temperature and temperature should be absolute. Should not be in degree centigrade. B and C are constants. Like, like for example, in the Sutherland equation, S was the constant. There was one constant. Here there are two constants, C and B. E is uh, exponential, exponential. Oh, what is the value of E power one? So yeah, but what is the value of E power one in numerically? 2.7, sorry, right. Okay. So you should know this. 10 power one is 10, E power one is 2.7 something. And you should know how to use it in calculator. Uh, okay, C figures A2 and A3 for variation of viscosity of some fluids with temperature. Okay, so here's a numerical regarding it. Okay, the dynamic viscosity of water at uh, 20 degrees centigrade is this, and the viscosity at 40 degrees centigrade is this. Using the equation, that equation, which is uh, for the viscosity of the liquid, estimate the viscosity at 30 degrees centigrade. So like, I, I will say like this, one and two, okay? So mu one at, at temperature T1, mu one is given. Dynamic viscosity of water at 20 degrees, 1.00 times four minus three, right? And the viscosity at 40 degree is this. So at T2, mu two is given, right? Now estimate the viscosity at 30 degree. So at T3, it should be mu three, which you have to find out. Is it clear? This is how it is. So at T1, mu one is given, at T2, mu two is given, at T3, you need to find mu three. Now why there are two temperatures for which two viscosities are given because there are two unknowns, C and B. C and B were the constants that are not given in the question. So you have to find out the constants yourself. Okay. Now, how to find out those constants? The idea is simple. Let me go through the idea with you. Okay. So if you remember the formula was this, right? Mu is equals to C e power b divided by t. If you take the ln of both sides, so it will become this formula. Can you understand it? So ln mu equals to ln c plus b by t. This is what mathematics, just taking ln of both sides. Okay. Now in this equation, I have T1 and mu1. I will substitute and I will get an equation where B and C are unknown. Then I have T2 and mu2. I will substitute again and I will get another equation where B and C are unknown. Right? So by using T1 mu1, I get this equation. And by using T2 mu2, I will get this equation. Right? So now I have two equations with two unknowns. I don't need to tell you how to find out the unknowns. This is simple mathematics and you are already an expert in mathematics. And I have full confidence in you guys. Okay. So with that, with that joke, so <laughs> I'll get the value of L and C and B. And so I can get the value of C and B. Okay. Correspondingly. So now I have this equation. Now this is the equation for this fluid. Mu is equals to, because I have the value of C, E power, I have the value of B divided by T. So now at, at, temperature, at, at a given temperature, I need to find what is the viscosity. I will, I will place that temperature. And at 30 degree, I can find out what will be the viscosity. So the viscosity comes out to be this. Is it clear?
Anything not clear so far? Okay. Do we take a, uh, shall we take a break of five, 10 minutes? And then we'll continue. <clears throat> Okay, students, uh, let's move over to next problem. Okay, let's move over to the next problem. This is about a Cauté flow. What is Cauté flow? Cauté flow is a flow in which uh, the velocity variation is linear. Okay, look, uh, let me give you an example. Suppose uh, I have uh, two planes, one this plate, one another plate. In between them, I have in between them I have fluid. Now suppose if I make this plate to move, so what will happen? The fluid in between will start moving with the plate, okay? And with this, there will be a velocity profile because at the at the bottom the velocity will be zero, at the top there will be some velocity v, okay? So we can draw the velocity profile, okay? Velocity will be increasing from zero to a specific value V. Now the question is that how is this increase? Is this increase linear or this increase like this or this increase like this, right? So these, these, these all these three are increasing, but what kind of profile is it? So if the profile is such that it is linear as a straight line, then we call this flow a Cauté flow. Cauté flow is a specific flow in which the velocity profile is linear, okay? So this is the problem for the case of the Cauté flow. Uh, Cauté flow is characterized by linear velocity profile. So this is how we characterize the Cauté flow. Uh, this is something for short question you should memorize. If I ask you in the exam, define Cauté flow. So Cauté flow is a flow which is characterized by linear velocity profile. That's the answer, simple half line answer, okay? <clears throat> so, given the question in the exam, doctor, I have never seen Cauté flow in my life. I have gone through this course, never discussed Cauté flow. So it is discussed here in this numerical. Two plates are separated by 3.175 centimeter of space okay so there are two plates and this is the space in between 3.175 centimeter the lower plate is stationary and the upper plate moves at a velocity of 7.62 meter per second okay uh, the, the oil sae 10w30 uh, 338.7 kelvin now this is the specification of the oil now, why is this specification of the oil is given? Because based on the specification, we can determine what is the viscosity. So there are tables for different kinds of oils and corresponding to different temperatures, we can actually get the value of viscosity of the oil. But most probably, I will provide you in the exam viscosity. I will not ask, provide you the table and then ask you to go into the table and find out what will be the viscosity. For this, I will directly provide you the viscosity. So which fills the space between the plates has the same velocity as the plate at the surface of the contact. The variation in velocity of the oil is linear. That's how, that is why it is Cauté flow, okay? What is the shear stress in the oil? So we need to know what is the shear stress in the oil. So the simple formula is that tau is equals to mu dV by dy. This is the formula, okay? And we need to find shear stress. How we how we are going to get the viscosity? It will be given in the question. Here the oil is given. Correspondingly, you can find out what will be the viscosity. But most probably, I'm telling you, I'm going to give you the viscosity directly in the question. So viscosity of the oil is given in the question. Okay. Uh, then dv by dy. dv is the change in velocity. So change in velocity across this length, across the across the distance, across the depth of the fluid. Okay, so at the bottom side velocity is zero, at the top side velocity is V. It's given velocity is 7.62 uh, 
meter per second. Okay. Since it is linear, so I can just simply write as del v as v naught minus v uh, v naught minus zero. It is since it is linear, divided by del y, it will be h minus zero. It will be this height. Okay. So the formula becomes mu v naught over h. Now v naught value is given. H value is given, H is this distance, 3.175 centimeter. Uh, mu value is given from the oil. So you just substitute the values, you can get what is the shear stress. Is it clear? Question is not solved here, but you can solve it yourself. Just putting the values. Okay, there is another problem, similar problem, but it is in the English units and this is solved here. Two plates are separated by one eighth, uh, one eighth of an inch space. The lower plate is stationary. The upper plate moves at a velocity of 25 feet per second. Uh, oil SAE 10 W30 150 Fahrenheit, which fills the space between the plates has the same velocity as the plates at the surface of the contact. The variation in velocity of the oil is linear. That means it is Kaute flow. What is the shear stress in the oil? The same formula, nothing new. Okay, so correspondingly to based on the oil, they determine what is the viscosity. Uh, since the oil is a Newtonian fluid and it has assumed Cauté flow, uh, Cauté flow, so we we'll have linear velocity profile. So based on that, first we find what is du by dy. Uh, du by dy is same as dv by dy. Okay, so it, which is delta v by delta y. Delta v is this. Delta y will be Okay, since uh, meter, meter units, I mean the length units are going to cancel, so they should be in the same unit, right? So here, if it is 25 feet per second, then for, for the Y, it should also be in feet, right? but it was given in inches. So convert it back that into feet, okay? Or converting this into inches, so that one also converted into inches. Either, either both be inches, so they cancel, or both be fit, so they can be canceled, okay? So we'll get the value of dv by dy multiplied by the viscosity. So we'll get uh, what is the shear stress. So shear stress is 1.25 pound feet per fixed square. Is it clear? Anything which is not clear within the solution? Well, let's see another problem here. The board one meter by one meter that weights 25 newtons slides down an inclined ramp, which is which has a slope of 20 degrees centimeter, 20 degree, uh, with a velocity of two meter, two centimeter per second. The board is separated from the ramp by a thin film of oil with a viscosity of 0 0.05 newtons second per meter square, neglecting edge effects. Calculate the space between the board and the ramp. So this is the case here. We have a ramp here. Where this ramp is an inclined surface, 20 degree. And we have a board on this surface, on this ramp, and the board is sliding down. In between the ramp and the board, there is oil. So you can say that you have an oil coating on the ramp. Because of that oil coating, the board is sliding down. Now you know what is the velocity of the board. What's given is, okay, the velocity of the board is given. It is given what is the weight of the board. It is given what are the dimensions of the board. It is given what is the slope. Okay, it is given what is the viscosity of the oil. Now we need to find out what should be the thickness of oil. Okay, what should be the thickness of the oil so that the board is actually moving at a velocity of two centimeter per second. Okay. So again, it's the same formula that we have to use here. Tau is equals to mu dv by dy. But here there is one thing is that we are given not shear stress, we are given here force. Okay, and now what is the relationship between force and the stress? So basically, stress is force over area, it's pressure units, right? Force over area, and the area is given one meter by one meter. Okay, so it will be basically tendential force, but there is again one another problem. The problem is that the force is the weight. And the weight is acting downward, but the shear stress will be the force which is tendential. 
which will be in the direction of the plane. Okay, so we have to divide the weight. This is the weight. We have to divide the weight into two components. One perpendicular to the surface, other parallel to the surface. And the one force which is parallel to the surface is the tangential force responsible for the shear stress. The other one is not. Okay, so since the ramp is 20 degree, so basically W sine 20 will be the component of the force parallel to the surface. Now, how it will be sine 20? Why not cos 20? It's a simple mathematical question. Probably you have done a multiple times in dynamics, statics, strength of materials, and mathematic courses. So I don't need to discuss it here. Okay. So you have the ramp 20 degree, a weight is acting downward. The component of the weight in the direction of the ramp will be sine 20. Okay. <laughs> so W sine 20 is this tangential force. Okay, so this tangential force will be tau into A. Tau multiplied by area. So let's uh, put it here. So this is the tangential force, which will be the shear force, tau into area. Okay. Now tau is mu dv by dy, right? And uh, mu dv by dy can be written as mu del v by del y. Okay. Now del v is something known because you know the velocity. Del y, this is something you need to find out because you don't know what is the thickness of the oil. Area is something known, given the board area. Viscosity is given, weight is given. So just one unknown. So you can just substitute the values and you can find out what will be the thickness of the oil. So the thickness of the oil will be 0.117 millimeter. So if this is the thickness of the oil, then the board is going to slide down with this speed. Definitely, if the oil thickness is going to vary, the velocity of the board sliding down will also vary, will also change. Is the solution of this problem clear? Is there anything within the solution of the problem which is not clear to anybody? Let's have another problem. A laminar flow occurs between two horizontal parallel plates under a pressure gradient dp by ds, p decreases in the positive s direction. The upper plate moves left negative at a velocity ut. The expression for the velo local velocity is this. The, uh, the situation is like this. We have one plate, we have another plate. In between the two plates, there is already flow in this direction, but I'm making the plate to move in this direction. Even if the plates were stationary, the flow was going in, in a, in a specific direction. But now at the same time, while the flow is moving in this direction, I'm making the upper plate to move in the opposite direction. So how would be the pro velocity profile? The velocity profile would be like this. Bottom, uh, bottom, surface, bottom surface is stationary, zero velocity. But then the velocity is increasing, increasing, and then it's going to decrease, decrease. It will again become zero at a certain point and then will become negative. Why? Because the upper plate is moving in the opposite direction. So the velocity profile will be like this. Bottom plate is stationary. So it will be zero velocity. But then the velocity will keep on increasing, increasing. Why? Because the flow is in this direction. It will become a maximum value. Then it will stop decreasing, decreasing, decreasing until it will become zero, not at the plate, but before the plate. Why? Because the plate is, is, is in the negative velocity direction. So then it will become negative and will become equal to the velocity of the plate at the top. So this is the kind of a flow that we have here. Now, this is not a Cauti flow. In Cauti flow, there is no flow, there, there is no fluid motion if the plate is not moving. Here in this case, the fluid was already moving, even if the plate was stationary. Secondly, the plate was supposed to move in one direction, in the same direction of the fluid motion, but here the plate is moving in the opposite direction. So this is not a Cauti flow, this is a different flow. So Cauti flow equation is not a value here, okay? So here the, the equation is provided here. This is the equation. 
minus 1 upon 2 mu dp by ds dp by ds is the pressure variation with distance okay uh, h is the height multiply by y y is this is the y direction so this this u is a given as a function of y into h y minus y square plus ut ut is that is the velocity of this top plate into y divided by h this is actually part of the problem because this is like, this formula is part of the question so you don't need to memorize it it will be there in the question itself we are discussing the question right now okay is the magnitude of shear stress greater at the moving plate or at the stationary plate so we have moving plate top one and stationary plate bottom one so we need to know that at which plate shear stress will be higher this is the first question okay secondly drive an expression for y position of zero shear stress i told you you will have a zero velocity position somewhere before the top plate that zero velocity position will have zero shear stress okay so we need to find out what will be the location of it okay so these are the two things we need to find out we have u as a function of y here u is given as a function of y right so it's simple because you see this is the formula for shear stress tau is equals to mu du by dy if u is given as a function of y can you find du by dy it's simple right so what will be du by dy u equals to these are all constants so if you differentiate hy it will become h and if you differentiate y square it will become 2y and here y by h it will become 1 over h this we are differentiated with respect to y it will become 1 over 1 upon h right so simple differentiation is not difficult okay so this multiply by mu you're going to get the shear stress okay so let's see here tau is equals to mu du by dy so it will become h minus 2y and here it will be 1 over h multiply by mu this was this is now the shear stress formula now we need to find out the shear stress at h is equals to sorry at 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 uh, at y equals to zero first for the bottom plate and y equals to h for the top plate so if i put y equals to h that will be for the top plate this will be the answer if i put y equals to zero that will be the bottom plate this will be the answer now look at the two expressions very similar express expressions here this plus this and here this minus this so which one will be bigger one where two are two expressions are added that one will be bigger one right so where will have the high high shear stress this one right simple by looking at the expression so maximum shear stress occurs along the moving plate where y equals to h okay now where will be the position of zero shear stress so if you have you have the equation for the shear stress if you just put tau equals to zero then find out the value of y so previously you put y equals to h then you put y equals to zero now you need to find y when tau is equals to zero so put tau zero and get the value of y so y comes out to be this term this is the point where the shear stress will be zero okay so this will be this point is it clear yes. okay so we have uh, let's have another problem a disk is rotated in a container of oil to damp the motion of an instrument uh, do you know what does damping means slow down you know you see here is a damper here uh, for for the case of the door okay, slow down the motion control the motion so uh, so we have a disk uh, is rotated in a container of oil to damp the motion of the instrument drive an equation for damping torque as a function of diameter of an s uh, omega angular velocity and viscosity okay s is the thickness of uh, thickness of the oil 
So here you'll have uh, the oil above the plate and oil below the plate. Okay. <clears throat> so basically torque is what? Torque is uh, force multiplied by the moment arm, right? Torque is force multiplied by moment arm, okay? So differential torque will be uh, differential force multiplied by the moment arm, okay? The moment arm here will be R, and the differential force, differential force will be force tau is equals to force over area. So force will be tau multiplied by area, right? So that will be tau multiplied by area. So this is tau and this will be the area. So differential area, differential area of the disc will be what? 2 pi r dr. Now again, this is, there is mathematics involved. What is differential area? How do you find it? I cannot go into the mathematics since you have already done it and you are already expert in it. So I trust your expertise here, okay? So this is the differential area. Differential area is two pi r dr for the case of the disc, multiply by the tau, which is the shear stress. So you're gonna get the force, force multiply by r, which is the moment arm. So you're gonna get the torque. Right, so this is, these are the differential points, okay? Now, tau will be what? Tau is mu dv by d by, okay? Now, mu is the viscosity. What will be v? V equals to r omega. Now, can somebody tell me, do you understand how v equals to r omega? Have you ever read this formula before? I think I've lost it. This is basically you studied in dynamics. Linear velocity, what's the relationship between angular velocity and linear velocity? So linear velocity is equals to radius into angular velocity. So it's r omega. Divided by S, S is dy here, which is the thickness of the thickness of the oil. Okay. So just substitute the values here. You're gonna get this term as a function of R, dr. So we have differential torque as a function of radius. So now we can integrate it. In, we can integrate it over the entire radius. So we can get the overall torque. Okay. Now here one thing is that this is for one side because we are using S here for one side, but here oil is on both sides, at the top as well as at the bottom. So you have to multiply it by two, okay? Because the same uh, uh, damping torque will be applied from the bottom as well as from the top, because oil is there both sides, okay? So multiply it by two, so it will become four here. Already the formula two was there. So multiply by two, it will become four here. So you're gonna get this formula integrated over the entire radius, zero to D by two. Why I did not do here zero to R? Why we did it zero to D by two? Why? Because in the question it is written, find it as a function of D S omega and mu. It was not written R S omega and mu. Since it was written, find it as a function of D. That's why I use zero to D by two instead of using zero to R. Is it clear? <clears throat> I can make this change in the exam. I will give this problem. And instead of writing D here, I will write here R. Problem will remain the same, only <laughs> your variables will vary a little and it will be good to see if you have memorized or understood. So memorizing is gonna really hurt you bad in this course. Okay. Understand it well, and that's it. Because I, will, I'm, I am going to make some changes, okay? But those changes will be something that I've previously discussed with you, first of all, and secondly, that would be easily understandable without giving you any new concepts ahead. Okay, so no new scenario, no new concepts. Something you already gone through. Okay, but if you have gone through, if you have not gone through, then it will be fun for me. Okay, so so integrate it. Uh, don't need to go in with, into this integration. Very simple integration. You are already experts in integration as well. So you got tau is equals to one over 16 pi mu omega d power four by s. So that will be the formula for the torque. Okay. So we are done with the topic of viscosity. This is one very important fluid parameter which we have studied here uh, from all different angles for the case of solids, for the case, sorry, for the case of liquids, for the case of gases with the variation in temperature when applying it over different scenarios, different conditions for the Cauté flow, for, for regular flows, okay, with 
I've lost a profile, so we have done it all through. Okay, so next is uh, a physical concept of uh, Newtonian versus non-Newtonian fluids. Did you study this concept before? I think you have studied it in, in chemistry before, most probably, or physics. Newtonian fluid and non-Newtonian fluids. It's, it's, it's a simple concept here. Uh, It is, it is a simple concept here, which says that uh, uh, stress is, if the stress is directly proportional, linearly proportional to uh, the strain, okay, then we call it a Newtonian fluid. If it is not linearly proportional, then we call it a non-Newtonian fluid. So we have uh, shear thinning fluids, we have shear thickening fluids, we have Bingham liquids, li uh, plus, uh, we have Bingham pl plastics, so these are different fluids which are non-Newtonian. What is shear thinning fluid? Shear thinning fluid is a fluid when if you start applying more and more stress, the fluid will become thin. Shear thickening is the more stress you are going to apply, the fluid will become thick. Okay. Then we have uh, some kind of fluids which are actually solids. But if you start applying stress, stress, as a level will reach, they will become liquefied suddenly. Okay, so that is the Bingham plastic. So, but anyway, these are all non-Newtonian fluids and we are not going to be discussing the non-Newtonian fluids in this course. The whole course of fluid is actually designed for the Newtonian fluids, okay? So what is a Newtonian fluid and what is a non-Newtonian fluid? By the definition, something that you should memorize. Memorize the definition of a Newtonian and non-Newtonian fluids, okay? Okay, so next topic is so far. Okay, we are now moving towards the next topic. So till here, everything is clear or not? Now I have an understanding and that is my speed is a bit fast, but uh, you have to understand here one thing also that uh, this is a huge course and we have a very limited amount of time and uh, my speed have to be fast. So this is one problem which I understand, it is fast. And this is why I told you in the last class that uh, from this week onward, you're gonna see that we, have been, we will be covering things very, very quickly, okay? So just imagine this is one lecture going on and by the end of the week, you will have four lectures done. One on Monday, then on Wednesday, then on Thursday, then on Friday. So by Friday, four lectures will be done and you will find out that 500 slides are already done. Okay, so it will be fast, okay. it will be fast. Okay, so you have to, you, you, you have to catch up with me here, but the, the good thing is that still the videos are there with you. So you can, if, if, if you miss something out, you can watch it on your own, okay. In your free, free time and whatever. Uh, so you can prepare accordingly if you, if you want, but otherwise it has to be a little fast as I told you. Uh, we have only six weeks that we have to cover everything, okay? And this is the first week of the six weeks. And we have about uh, 16 lectures, each lecture three hours. So that's about 48 hours of study that is needed. Yeah, obviously it won't be the exact 48 hours that we will be covering, but uh, still material is a lot. I've already uploaded all the material, all the slides which we will be covering in the uh, on the GCR, the textbook is there, so you can go through with the material. Okay, I will be uploading the video lectures. Already uploaded the first video lecture. Okay, provided you the link, so you can go through that lecture. Uh, did anybody try to access it? Are you able to access the video lecture? It was accessible, right? Okay, let's move over to the next topic, which is elasticity. When the pressure on a given mass of a fluid increases, the fluid contracts, resulting in an increase in density, and the reverse occurs when the pressure decreases. Elasticity is by the term, the way we understand what is an elastic. 
Okay. Sometimes we say that, okay, we need an elastic material. Okay. So elastic is basically what? Something that you can stretch. And then when you release, it will come back. This is elastic, right? And so the same properties apply over the fluid as well. Sometimes you have a fluid and if you apply pressure, the fluid will contract. And when you release, the fluid will return back. Same concept. You apply the, you apply the pressure, you apply the force, it will deform. And then when you release, it will return back. So that's why it is given the name elasticity, okay? So this is the thing, opposite is also possible. You release the pressure. So the thing will expand. Then you again supply the pressure, it will contract. So both ways are possible. Elasticity of a fluid is described by the bulk modulus of elasticity. So we have a terminology here, which is uh, bulk modulus of elasticity. I think you have studied bulk modulus of elasticity in solids as well. And in the course of, in the course of, in the course of, <laughs> not dynamics, a thing in strength of material, right? Som, right? So bulk modulus of elasticity. It's the same concept of solids is applied in fluids as well. Okay. So uh, change in pressure divided by fractional change in volume or density. Okay. Fractional change in volume or density is what? Change in volume per unit original volume or change in density per unit original density. Okay. So DP over DV by V or DP over D rho by, do, by rho. Okay, but here is a negative sign here, which is important. Why negative sign here? The negative sign here is because of the nature here that if you increase the pressure, the volume will decrease. So there is an inverse proportionality. If you increase the pressure, the volume will decrease. If you increase the pressure over something, its volume will decrease. If then goes for density. And if you decrease the pressure, volume will increase. So in order to correct this thing that increasing one decreases the other, we have to put a negative sign here so that the answer comes out to be positive. Okay. So dV by V should be a negative value. So that the negative of this dV by V will cancel the negative sign here. And your answer of EV will be positive. Is it clear? So change in pressure over fractional change in volume or density. And here in the formula, we have a negative sign. Okay. The formula for the modulus of bulk modulus of elasticity will be provided to you in the exam. You do not have, have to memorize it. Okay. For ideal gas, CV is uh, um, P isothermal for KV equals to KP adiabatic for with KCP by CV. Compressibility. Compressibility is basically inverse of or, or reciprocal of elasticity. So one over elasticity is actually compressibility. Okay. So compressibility is one over elasticity. This is an important thing because this thing will not be provided in exam. Formula for Elasticity will be provided in the exam, but compressibility is reciprocal of elasticity. This thing will not be provided in exam. Okay. There is just a little comparison for water as well as for air, so that you can check what is the compressibility of water and what is the compressibility of air and what is the actually ratio of compressibility of air with that of the compressibility of water. So most of the fluids are considered to be modeled as constant density. So constant density means their density is not varying. If their density is not varying with pressure, that means they are incompressible. Okay. So most of the fluids, mostly liquids. 
but for the gases, obviously they vary a lot. Okay, so they are not considered com uh, incompressible. So here is a simple problem related to it. Water in a 1000 centimeter cube volume is subjected to a pressure of two into 10 power six Newton per meter square. So this is the pressure DP, okay. Uh, this is the original volume, okay. Uh, find the volume after pressure applied, okay. So we need to find the new volume. So first we need to find what is the change in volume. So we have the formula E equals to negative del P V over DV, okay? So here, since we are talking about water, so value of E is provided to you, okay? So you know what is E, you know what is V, you know what is del P. So if substituting the values, you can find what is del V, change in volume. So if the original volume was 1000 and change in volume is negative 0.9091, so the final volume will be, 999.1. So by application of this much pressure, now the volume of water will become this. Okay, so that will be the final volume. So there is a small problem. How much pressure should be subjected to water if it is required to reduce the volume by 1%? I mean, you can try it yourself. That's a simple problem. So that's the concept of elasticity. Concept of elasticity is done. Anything which is not clear so far? Everything is clear, right? Huh? Next topic is surface tension. Now there are only two properties left with this, our, our this lecture will be done. Actually our two lectures will be done because it is written for lecture week three and lecture week two and three. And we are completing it in one, it's okay. Surface tension. Uh, the point is that uh, if I'm going fast to the extent that you are not able to understand, then there's an issue. But if I'm going fast, but in a way that you are able to understand, and there is no such topic so far gone that you feel that you do not understand, then it's not an issue for me. It is still an issue for you because the more we cover, the more you have to cover. Okay, But for me, not an issue. Surface tension. The molecules at the surface of the liquid have a greater attraction for each other than they do for the molecules below the surface. The surface behaves as if it was a skin or membrane stretched over the fluid mass. Actually, this happens. What happened is that, suppose you see here, we have, uh, we have a liquid here. Let's say we have a liquid here and there are molecules. Now, the thing is that the molecules are all stretching each other, all attracted by each other, okay? So there is a force in all direction for us, for any molecule, there are forces in all direction, okay? However, only for the case of molecules, which are at the surface, there are forces from the down and the sideways, but there is no force from the upward. So there is no force from the upward, nothing is there upward. Yeah, from the down and from the sideways, molecules are stretching and attracting each other, but there is nothing from the upward. Since there is nothing from the upward, so the, so, so, the, so, so the molecules form a boundary layer, okay? So the molecules which are there at the boundary are not free to move outside. Why? Because outside there are no forces which are pulling them up. Only from the molecules at the sideways or down which are pulling them down, nothing from the up, okay? So they cannot move up. So the molecules forms a boundary. That's why liquid forms a boundary. Okay, so you can see the liquid boundary. Liquid is contained there. There are liquid molecules that down which are holding them all together. Okay, nothing is on the upside which is actually pulling it towards up. So in order for the molecule to escape this boundary, molecule need to have enough energy so that it can escape. So it overcome the forces from the downside and then it escapes out. So you need to heat it. Okay. So then it escapes. Otherwise, it will stay there like this. And so we have a specific tension generated at the surface. So 
So there is a specific tension generated at the surface. Okay. And that calls for surface tension that actually originates the concept of surface tension. And this is in reality a surface. Yeah, this surface is very weak for the for the forces we are dealing with. If you put your finger in it, your finger will easily penetrate the surface. Okay, but if the force is very small, sometimes if, let's say you, you, you put a piece of paper on it, the paper won't be able to penetrate the surface. So it will stay on the surface. Even sometimes needle, these, this is, these are simple experiments you can see on the YouTube. You go on YouTube and, see, and, and write uh, needle floating on water. Now needle is made of what? Iron, steel, steel is heavier than water. So normally if you put a steel on water, it should sink. But you can find videos on YouTube where people will very uh, gently place the needle on the surface of water and they will say, you will see that the needle is floating. How is it floating? Surface tension is not allowing it to go inside. It's not allowing it to penetrate. Okay. And this concept was very, very crucial. Why? Because initially when the concept of density was there and specific gravity came, so it was very clear that the needle is made up of iron or steel. It should go down. Why is it not going down? So that makes, that makes a dilemma that it should go down. Why is it not going down? Why is it not sinking? So, so there has to be something else which is holding it up. And that something else is the surface tension, the tension generated at the surface. And it is a real thing. Yeah, for most of the forces that we deal, we can easily penetrate it. We can easily break those surface tensions and penetrate inside. But if the forces are very small, they are, they are good enough to hold. And this thing is visible there. Okay. So the molecules at the surface of the liquid have a greater attraction for each other than they do for molecules below the surface. The surface behaves as if it were a skin or membrane, a very, very thin layer of a skin, a very thin layer of membrane, very weak membrane, but it is there. It is weak, but it is there. Okay. It's stretched over the fluid mass. It is stretched all, all over the fluid mass. Because of the membrane effect, each portion of the surface exerts tension on adjacent portions of the surface or on objects that are in contact with the liquid surface. The tension acts in the plane of the surface. This surface tension is only on the plane. If you go inside the fluid, there is no surface tension. It's only, only there on the plane. Or the, 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 the objects which are placed on the surface, they feel it. Otherwise, if, if, if the same object sinks inside, then there is no surface tension. Okay. The tension acts in the plane of the surf surface. The magnitude of the tension per unit length is defined as the surface tension. Okay, so this surface tension is calculated for air water surface. This surface tension is about, uh, okay, it is written as, uh, what, what do we say the symbol? Sigma, yes. It is written as sigma. So sigma is 0 0.073 Newton per meter for the case of air water interface. The concept of surface tension has been used to explain several commonly observed phenomena. Examples of these are wicking. Water will wick into a paper towel. Ink will wick into the paper. Okay. Tissue paper, tissue paper, ko paani ke karib leke jayen, wo paani uske andar upar chadta hai paani. The question is that why, how is water climbing up? Ab, ab literally tissue paper ko lein roll kare, niche paani ka drop ho, uske upar dalen. Aisa lagega paani upar chad raha hai. How? How is water climbing up? It's because of the surface tension. Okay. Because it is the, the, the surface of the water, there is a tension which comes in contact with the body. And if the body has pores inside, it can easily climb up. And because of this surface tension, all the trees in the universe, they get hydrated. How does the tree get water? It is from downside. And it goes from the root to the top of the branch, okay, top of the tree. 
अगर दरख्त के सबसे ऊपर भी कोई पत्ता है तो उसको भी पानी पहुंचेगा हाउ बिकॉज ऑफ द सर्फिस टेंशन द होल प्लांट लाइफ इज सर्वाइविंग बिकॉज ऑफ द सर्फिस टेंशन वॉटर पेनिट्रेट सीक्स इन टू ईच एंड एवरी फोर इट हैज द स्पेसिफिक कैपेसिटी because it is sticks and at the surface there is tension there is force that helps it to climb up clear so wicking is a very important phenomena water will wick into a paper towel ink will wick into a paper polypropylene wicks perspiration away from body a steel needle will clip or clip a steel needle or clip will float on water steel can never float on water as per the law of density its density is much much higher than water it must go down but if it is floating there is some force which is not making it to sink and what is this force surface tension if placed gently on the surface because the surface tension supports the needle insects walk on water This is another phenomenon. When they when they saw the insects and they tried to find out the density of the insects, turns out the density of the insects is higher than the water. How can they walk on water? Because of the surface tension. Okay. Droplets and soap bubbles. The excess pressure created inside droplets or bubbles. If 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 you make a bubble inside the bubble, there is an excess pressure generated. how does this excess pressure generated is explained it's because of the surface tension so there are a lot of phenomena which are actually only explained if you we analyze the sur surface tension if 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 we bring this into the equation then those phenomena are explained otherwise they are no way explained further going into surface tension we have uh, adhesion cohesion adhesion is basically attraction force between dissimilar objects cohesion is attraction force between similar objects okay water wets glass because adhesion is greater than cohesion now for each fluid there are two different kind of phenomena adhesion and cohesion when the fluid tries to hold on its own self that is cohesion when the fluid tries to hold on to something else that it that is that is adhesion so if the fluid has larger adhesion less cohesion then this fluid is going to rise up it it will wet the surface means it will stick with the surface if the fluid has more cohesion and less adhesion then the fluid is not going to wet the surface it going to stay within itself the most common example is mercury i can take a bulk of mercury in my hand and the my hand will not go, go wet i put on this hand nothing is there on this hand i will put it down nothing is there on my hand why because mercury has a lot of cohesion inside less adhesion very little almost negligible it does not ad adhere at all it does not stick wet anything okay so water wets glass because adhesion is greater than cohesion okay now here comes another concept which is the contact angle whenever a liquid comes in contact with the surface there is a specific contact angle which is generated between the liquid and the surface okay now the important thing is that how do we see if the if the fluid has higher adhesion or less adhesion if the fluid has higher cohesion or less cohesion how do we see this we see this through the contact angle so you have two surfaces put a droplet of water put a droplet of mercury okay and see the angle water is making with the surface and the angle mercury is making with the surface okay if you see if you put a droplet of mercury it will go like this it will go like this on the surface if you put a droplet of water it will go like this so you can see here there is a contact angle that can be made and here there is a contact angle that can be visualized so for those fluids which are non wetting the contact angle will be greater than 90 and those which are wetting the contact angle will be less than 90 clear
so a lot of theoretical questions can come from this slide what are wetting liquids what are non wetting liquids what is the contact angle for the wetting liquids what will be the contact angles for the non wetting liquids i told you for the wetting liquids adhesion is more cohesion is less for the non wetting cohesion is more adhesion is less so a lot of short questions can come from here as i told you in the exams not in the quizzes quizzes might be mostly numerical or if there is a theoretical part i will all, all i will inform you before but for the mid and the final at least 30% of the exam paper will be theoretical 70% numerical or i will say 30% or less theoretical maybe 25% theoretical 30% or less theoretical and 70% or more numerical but there will be theoretical content and that theoretical content would be conceptual and that conceptual things would be the ones which i will always tell you in the lecture beforehand so that you know that what are the things that i can bring in the exam from the theoretical part okay. is it clear yes. okay so there is a specific action which is known as the capillary action the capillary action is the wicking action which is explained by surface tension as i told you if you if you make a uh, if 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 you make a uh, tissue paper roll and put it on the water droplet you will actually see water droplet climbing up now this phenomena of climbing up against the gravity that is known as capillary action that is known as capillary action and, and actually within the within the trees as well we have a lot of capillaries through where through which water goes up okay so this is known as capillary action and this capillary action is only only explained by the concept of surface tension okay. so capillary action is the rise or repulsion which describes the tendency of uh, of of a liquid to rise in narrow tubes or to be drawn into small openings it is responsible for water being drawn into the narrow openings in soil or into the narrow openings between fibers of a dry paper towel okay surface tension is expressed in terms of force per unit length force along an interface divided by length of the interface that is basically the surface tension so let's see an example here capillary action in a small tube determine the height of the water column so suppose i have uh, a, a container filled with water and what i do is that i put a small uh, column small capillary straw small straw into this water container so water will rise up now to what height water will rise how can we determine what will be the height to which water will rise we can actually determine it by the force balance we can actually determine it by the force balance now how do we do the force balance let's do the force balance over over this surface over this body this is the water body which has risen up this is the water body which has risen up inside the capillary now if you look here at the top surface what do we call it meniscus right when you when you study chemistry labs practicals you see it is upper meniscus lower meniscus something like this right so if you look here at the meniscus you will find that at the edges water is trying to go up so there is surface tension forces at the edges okay surface tension forces at the edges where we have the water solid interface okay on the other hand we have the weight of the water body which is pulling down so now there are two forces which are actually fighting against each other surface tension wants to pull the water up the weight of the water is trying to pull the water down now water will go up until the surface tension force is higher than the weight 
but as the water is going up the water column is increasing so the weight of the water in the column is also increasing so time will come when the two forces will balance each other the force of the water column which is the weight will become equal to the surface tension force which is trying to pull the water up and this is the point when the water will stop when the two forces balance each other okay so when this force is balanced by this force then the water will stop otherwise what the water will continue to rise up so we can actually see this balance so this force will be basically what sigma multiplied by length length will be what it is the point of intersection where the water is in contact with the surface circumference of the tube circumference is a length what is the circumference of a circle pi d right so sigma multiplied by pi d that will be the surface tension force which will be pulling the water up okay next thing is the weight which is actually acting downward and weight acting downward how much will be that it will be w is equals to w equals to mg right or i can say w is equals to if i write mass in terms of density how can i write density what's the relationship of density and mass what's the relationship between density and mass density is equals to mass over volume so mass is equals to density into volume let me write here like this density into volume into g right now what is density into g we studied density into g is gamma specific weight right so it's gamma into v right so this is gamma and now this is v volume so volume will be what volume will be height multiplied by height multiplied by cross sectional area so cross sectional area will be pi r square or pi d square by 4 multiply by cross section multiply by height is delta h is it clear so this will be weight so now you just just, just substitute it here basically f sigma cos theta cos theta why because this is acting at a certain angle and that will be the contact angle that will be the contact angle at which this force will be acting upward right the contact angle it is going to make with the capillary okay. so we have to find the force in the direction of in the direction opposite to the weight okay so force in the direction opposite to the weight will be cos theta right so it will be f sigma cos theta minus w equals to 0 that will be the balance this will be the point when the water will stop rising okay so now just substitute the values so f sigma okay for the case of water with glass the theta is almost zero almost zero it's not zero but very small that we can consider it to be zero so if it is zero so cos theta will be one so it will be f sigma minus w okay so f sigma is sigma pi d minus w will be w is gamma pi d square by 4 into del h so we can find what is del h so del h will be 4 sigma over gamma d so we have actually find out the formula for height in a capillary tube so height in a capillary capillary tube depends upon the diameter of the capillary tube is this formula clear is this a small derivation clear or not this is one of the small derivation that you should memorize because i because i can ask you to drive it in exam so there is a possibility that i do not provide you this formula and i ask you to drive this formula yourself is it clear okay. 
whenever there is a derivation which i can give you an exam in short questions in a theoretical part i i will always always tell you during the lecture that these are these are the things that you have to memorize for the exam so this derivation which i have done here i can ask you in exam there is a possibility that i can provide you the formula and do not ask you the derivation but uh, there is also a possibility that i can ask you this is what i will decide when i will be making the exam in the same way we can see uh, the, the case where uh, where a needle is balanced by the water tension weight of the needle is trying to go down is trying to penetrate the water but the surface of the water at the surface of the water you have water tension which is pulling the which which is pushing the needle up and the needle is not going down if you put the needle on the surface of the water and the needle is not going down the weight of the needle is there something is is resisting it something is balancing it that it is not going down so that's the surface tension so we can also find it out numerically okay there how much it is again it will be the same formulation f sigma cos theta minus w equals to 0 so in this case it will be the weight of the needle which is placed on water okay so f sigma will be sigma into 2l needle is like this if you see from the top the needle will be like this right needle will be like this so if this is the length of the needle so on this so we so we will have a length of the needle here we will have length of the needle here then we will have a small thickness of the needle which will be in contact with water but ignore the small thickness because it is so small compared to the length you can ignore it so the circumference for the case of the needle in contact with the water surface will be just 2l l on one side l on the other side okay if you look here this is the needle so l here l here and l here across the length that will be the circumference in contact of needle with water okay so we'll have sigma 2l we are ignoring the diameter because it's very small compared to the length for the case of the needle okay so sigma 2l minus gamma pi d square by 4 into l okay so we can find out that what is the uh, what should be the diameter to be hold nahi ye to aapko dalna hoga ye force ka formula dekhiye force ka formula is coming from here let me just tell you surface tension is equals to force divided by length of the interface now force barabar ho gayi surface tension into length of the interface surface tension is sigma now you have to just decide what is the length of the interface for the case of the capillary length of the interface was circular interface was circumference for the case of the needle length of the interface is this l plus this l 2l right so this is something that you have to decide on your own based on the problem but again this is another formula which i can ask you to derive surface tension wale formulas they there are both options possible maybe i will provide you in the exam and i don't ask you to drive it or maybe i can ask you to drive it okay. similarly the if you want to find out the pressure inside a water droplet okay or if you want to find out the pressure inside a water bu bubble there is a difference when it is droplet it is filled with water it's a small ball of water filled with water when it is a bubble there is air out air in but there is only a surface of water thin surface of water that is that is bubble okay so the difference in the case of droplet and water bubble is only that in the case of water bubble you will have two surface interfaces in water droplet inside is water the interface is only outside 
in case of droplet but in case of bubble you have air in you have air out so you have two interfaces one interface is of the water surface with the in air inside air other interface is with the water surface with the outside air so surface tension will be double for the case of water bubble compared to the droplet that's the only difference otherwise the formulation is the same so this formulation is given here i want you to go through it yourself there is nothing complicated into it there is a small numerical here again this numerical is very simple given the case that you have already derived the formula or once you have already derived the formula then it's just plugging in the values within that formula okay so uh, to what height above the reservoir level will water at 20 degree rise in a glass tube such that there is such that as shown in figure 2.7 if the inside diameter of the tube is 1.6 mm this is for the case of the capillary so for the capillary we already derived the formula okay here in this question first they have derived it as i told you i can ask you to first derive it and then put the values so this is the same derivation we did it here you see delta h is 4 sigma over gamma d okay so this derivation is done here initially delta h is equals to 4 sigma over gamma d then just putting the values okay sigma value is again it is for water provided in the exam okay sigma for water provided in the exam gamma for water i already asked you to memorize it diameter already given in the question 1.6 mm substitute the values you're going to get 18.6 mm so the water in this capillary will rise 18.6 mm so that is uh, capillary rise now there is only one last topic which is vapor pressure there is no numerical in, about it but the pressure at which a water liquid will boil is called its vapor pressure okay uh, the vapor pressure increases as the temperature increases uh, in fact this topic i will ask you to go through it yourself there is no numerical associated with this topic but uh, there is a specific concept of uh, cavitation that is explained by the vapor pressure now what is this topic cavitation uh, i want you to search it yourself from the internet normally what happens is that when you have uh, devices uh, there is a specific pressure limitation that you can make the liquid to flow through these devices under these pressures and if the pressure blow if the pressure falls blow a certain limited amount of pressure then what happen the vapors are generated and those vapors then collapse on the surface of the uh, on the surface of the veins or the blades if you have a rotating blades rotating veins so the bubbles come and they collapse at the point where the bubble collapse huge amount of forces are generated and they are so strong enough that they can chip out some of the surface of the blade and you will see that when the uh, uh, when the, uh, the cavitation occurs so most of the time the fan the fan blades or propeller blades they actually uh, fail okay so they get broken they get uh, wasted okay so because of that now this is the concept of cavitation which is explained by the vapor pressure which is a fluid property Uh, but i want you to go through this fluid property yourself study it on your own uh, there is no numerical associated with it uh, there is, there can be a theoretical question from it in exam uh, but that will be only conceptual okay so with this our chapter number 2 is finished which is about the fluid properties there are some homework problems associated with it these homework problems you can find it in your textbook these are from your textbook okay so you have to cover it so in in the in the midterm exam we will be covering chapter 1 2 and 3 so chapter 1 we are all you are already provided the homework problems chapter 2 these are the homework problems chapter 3 we will have homework problems as well so combine chapter 1 2 and 3 that will be your first assignment that you have to submit now there is another question that uh, shall we make a individual assignment or a group assignment so this is something that we will discuss okay in case if you want a group assignment there is a advantage and there is a disadvantage advantage is that uh, your work will be reduced a little for the submission purpose but the disadvantage is that maybe you will not focus over the 
assignment. And then if the question comes from the assignment in the exam, you will get surprised, okay? So this is a disadvantage, but uh, this is something it's up to you. If you guys decide you want a group, you want to have a, as a group, I can give you a group, okay? Otherwise, these are the homework assignments that you have to submit, okay? Okay, that's it for today. Is there anybody, anything anybody want to ask? First of all, do, are you able to catch up with me throughout? Okay. Uh, yes, I know I'm fast. Okay, so if this is, a, if this is an issue, then that's, an, that's acceptable to me at this stage. But the thing which is not acceptable to me is that I'm going in a speed that you are not able to understand. Then this will be an issue. Yeah, if, if I'm going fast, but you are able to understand, it's okay with me, okay? So my point is that, are you able to catch up? Are you able to understand? Is there anything which you feel that I just go through and you did not understand at all? So you're more, more than welcome. You're free to let me know, okay? Uh, that's it. Alhamdulillah, whole class is present. So. You guys have to decide. What? It's okay. We will do it on Friday then. Okay. Who is one will be from chapter number one and two. Means still here. Still what we have studied here. Chapter number one, two, and three together will be midterm exams. Okay. No, no. I, I, I do not give MCQs at all. Okay. No, I do not give MCQs at all. Okay. MCQs help the student a lot. Because you are so friendly with each other. Okay, so I don't want you to help each other during exam. Before exam is good. So. <laughs> well, I have not yet made any exam yet, but once I'm going to make an exam, I will let you know that what kind of exam I have made. Okay. But the quiz will not be more than half an hour. It will be within half an hour. So I have to decide that uh, what kind of numerical I have to give or maybe some conceptual thing which I have already tell, told in the class I can give that I will give. Okay, so this is something that I'll decide on my own, but I have time restriction that I will keep it less than half an hour. Okay, so that's for today.